So this DNA project was talked about when I first met James in October 2016. It was July 2017, so less than a year ago when we formally set it up. And eventually many of you would have gotten an email from us in October of last year inviting you to join and to send in your DNA samples to Family Tree DNA. So I'm going to begin by outlining the basics of what DNA is. DNA is short for a very long word that you don't need to remember, deoxyribonucleic acid. Every living organism gets DNA from its parents. DNA is made up of a number of components with different inheritance paths. Uh, they are chromosomes and the mitochondria, and they're made up of chemical molecules. Again, you don't need to remember these words, adenine, cytosine, guanine, and thymine, and we just represent those by the letters A, C, G, and T. So you can think of your DNA as very long strings of the letters A, C, G, and T in various combinations. There are lots of surname groups around the world using DNA for family research to try and establish the origins of the surnames. In the case of common surnames like Smith and Miller and so on that come from occupations, there are probably hundreds of different origins. Surnames that, like OD that come from the name of a supposed common ancestor. We would like to think we'd find only one common origin. But the DNA does not always follow the surname. They said there's about a 2% rate of what we call NPEs, non-paternal events or non-paternity events, or more sensible uh, term is not the parent expected. <laughs> so if you think we're going back 30, 40, 50 generations to Kos or Jia, who are reputedly our common ancestor, um, and a 2% chance of somebody straying at each generation, it's not surprising that eventually there's some amount of genetic diversity in each surname. So where do we get our DNA from? We all started out as a sperm fertilizing an egg. The sperm, if we're male, had a Y chromosome. If we're female, it had an X chromosome. They're different lengths. That determines our gender. The sperm also, from the father, brings two paternal autosomal chromosomes, or autosomes for short and they're paired up with another 22 autosomes that come through the egg from the mother. So that autosomal DNA comes exactly half from the father, exactly half from the mother. The Y chromosome, if you have one, you're male and you got it from your father. We all have at least one X chromosome. Those of us who are female have two X chromosomes. If you're female, you've got one X from each parent. If you're male, you've got your only X chromosome from your mother. But we also all get mitochondrial DNA which comes in the egg from the mother. Men and women have it, but it comes from the mother, and the mother's mother, and the mother's mother, and so on. That's not very easy to do genealogy on, because all those women married and changed their surnames. So every generation you have a different surname. The Y chromosome is much easier, it comes from the father, the father's father, the father's father's father, and so on. And in most cultures, the surname comes from the father, and the father's father, and the father's father's father, and follows the same male line as the um, Y chromosome. So let me just show you my family tree. Here's me, Patrick Walden Jr. My father, Patrick Sr., gave me his Y chromosome, which he got from his father, Jack Waldron, which he got from his father, Thomas Waldron, which he got from his father, Thomas Waldron, and so on, back along. I got my mitochondrial DNA from my mother, Noreen Durkin who got it from her mother, Bridget Durkin, who was a Durkin before and after marriage. She married another Durkin. <laughs> and she got her mitochondrial DNA from her mother, Anne O'Neill, and she got it from her mother, she, Mrs. Mary O'Neill. I haven't been able to establish her maiden surname. So in my case, there's only two surnames along that line because one is unknown, and one woman didn't have to change her name when she married because her husband had the same name. Then the autosomal DNA comes equally from everyone in every generation. So I get 1 16th of my autosomal DNA from each of these 16 people here. And let's just go back another generation from Catherine Parker to her mother, Mary Keyes. There's 32 on that generation. You're only seeing 16 on the screen at a time. And then there's 64 on this generation. Most of them I haven't identified. But thanks to submitting my DNA to the online DNA databases about four years ago, I discovered that one of my uh, great 
great, great, great grandparents was a Marie O.D. who came from Newtown near Clarina in County Limerick, just across the Shannon Estuary from us here. So I have some little claim to be attending the O.D. gathering <laughs> by genetics as well as by a little bit of my knowledge. And I'll go into the details of how we work that out if there's time at the end of the talk. So just to summarize the inheritance paths, Y chromosome, only males have it, comes down the patrilineal line with the surname, X chromosome, males have one, females have two. That makes it a little bit complicated. Uh, so we have these nice colored charts to show who we might get bits of our X chromosome from. It recombines when a female is born, sorry, when an egg is created, the mother's paternal and maternal X chromosomes recombine and the two produce one containing bits of each and that's what the egg and the child then contains. So for a man, he gets one X chromosome from his mother, who's represented by the pink. She has one X chromosome each from her father and her mother. Uh, her father has one from his mother. So you cannot get X DNA from any ancestor if you have to go through two consecutive males to get back to that ancestor. So we're not going to go into that. That's the complicated bit. That's the advanced course. Uh, we won't talk about that today. The autosomal DNA you may be very familiar with. Let me just do a show of hands. How many men here are in our Family Tree DNA project already? 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, about 15. So we have about a quarter, a quarter or a third of the men in the project here. How many women here are in the Family Tree DNA project? One, two, two, good. Um, how many people here have sent their DNA to any of the commercial DNA companies and are not in the project? Quite a lot. But you're very welcome to sign up and show you how to sign up later on. Uh, you have, most of you probably sent your DNA to Ancestry DNA, which is by far the biggest company in that market. It was once involved in Y-DNA and surname projects, and it closed down that division. And it has closed down other things like its desktop software, Family Tree Maker, which it sold also. We don't trust Ancestry DNA. It does things to what we call Ancestry standards. And beginners think we're complementing something when we say it's done to Ancestry standards, but the advanced genealogist knows that that's not a compliment. Um, but you can copy your autosomal DNA data from most of the other DNA companies over to Family Tree DNA, and that's one way into the project, but then you'll still have to order Y DNA analysis if you're an OD male and send in a, a separate swab, even if you've already sent in a spit sample to Ancestry or one of the others. And the mitochondrial DNA is the one that comes down the female line. Um, we can use mitochondrial DNA if we have a, a brick wall in our family and we have two women and we think they're, they have the same mother. We look for mitochondrial DNA from their descendants and if it matches, it's very likely they have the same mother. If it doesn't match, they don't have the same mother. And it's the same sort of thing with the X chromosome. If you have two men and you think they have the same mother, but you're not sure were they brothers or were they first cousins, you look at their X DNA, which they may have passed down to some of their descendants. And if you find a good X DNA match between two men and there's other evidence that they might have had the same mother, now you have even stronger evidence. So in theory, 98.5% or something of our DNA is identical. And we're looking at a tiny part of the DNA which varies from one individual to another. It's about one and a half percent of the total. And the same thing applies to the X chromosome. In theory, most of our DNA is transcribed exactly from the relevant parent to the child. But sometimes, as in any transcription project, if you're a genealogist, you know about the transcription errors in transcription projects. The same thing happens transcribing DNA from parent to child. Or sometimes one letter is different in the child from what it was in the parent. And that's what we call a mutation. Most of them are harmless. Some of them are far from harmless. Some are incompatible with life. Some cause diseases. Here in Ireland, we have genetic diseases like cystic fibrosis and hemochromatosis, which are more common than they are anywhere else in the world. And they're the result of mutations that happened in DNA many hundreds or thousands of years ago um, that have been passed down through the generations that cause those diseases. And we probably all know that 
the police for decades now have been using DNA to identify criminals. They're looking for DNA that mutates quite frequently so that the only two people who will have matches on those DNA markers are people who are the same person. The only two samples that will match would be two samples from the same person. We're looking for something different. We're looking for mutations so that we can tell people apart, but we want them to be quite rare mutations that only happen many generations apart so that the patterns that we see in the DNA are the same for closely related people, as well as for examples from, from the same person, examples from the criminal and the crime scene. Not criminal. <laughs> we'll, come back to, we'll come back to using DNA for criminals in a moment. So there's two types of mutations that um, we see on the Y chromosome that are used to build up a family tree, a genetic tree, or a haplo tree, or a phylo tree. It has lots of different names. The first one is the short tandem repeat. So we might see somewhere on the Y chromosome, which is just a long string of millions and millions of letters, something like that string, CCTG, CCTG, CCTG. There's a pattern there. It's four letters repeated over and over. Um, and in some people, it will be repeated seven times. And if there's a mutation, there might be an eighth repeat, or there might be only six repeats. And we use patterns of those counts of repeats to work out who's most closely related. Two people with six copies of CCTG are probably more closely related than a person with six copies is to a person with seven copies. The other type of mutation is the single nucleotide polymorphism. Again, you don't need to remember these big words. We just call them SNPs, stirs and SNPs. And that's just one location where a single letter is changed from the parent to the child. Um, and usually at that location, some people will have an A, other people will have a C. You just see two letters in the population. You rarely see all three or all four occurring in different people at the same location. So family tree DNA, you have to pay. We have discounts. I have a box of kits here. If you haven't already sent off your swabs to Family Tree DNA and you want to do it, we can do it after lunch. Um, and they will look for the STR and SNP mutations on your Y chromosome. And there's the home page coming up with the details of the cost. The Family Finder test, which is on sale because it's the American Mother's Day this week, other parts of the world have Mother's Day at different times. Is it the third or fourth Sunday in Lent, I think, was the convention of Mother's Day, but the Americans have both moved it to a big stage in May. Uh, that's the Family Finder is the equivalent of the Ancestry DNA test. It's $59 on the sale. The Y DNA, it says there, from 169. If you order it online, you also pay a shipping fee of twelve euro fifty or uh, twelve dollars fifty. But we have a special offer of $129 and no shipping fee if you want to do it with us here and the mitochondrial DNA, because that's the one that comes down the mother's line. That's the most heavily discounted in the Mother's Day sale. It's 149. But that doesn't come down with your OD surname. It changes surname every generation. Um, these mutations, the STR mutations, can switch back and forth. It can be six repeats for a few generations, and then it might be seven repeats in the next few generations, and then it might switch back to six, or it might switch up to eight. Some of the SNP mutations are very helpful because they're once in the history of mankind events. One man had an A in this location and his son had a C. And that son's sons and grandsons and great grandsons down to the present all had the letter C. And nobody else in the whole world has a C in that location if they're not descended from the first man who had that mutation. So that makes it very easy to use these once in the history of mankind mutations to build genetic family trees. And when we find a location like that, we give it a label, a letter, and numbers. L226 is probably the most famous from our point of view. It's called the Dalcassian mutation or the Dalcassian SNP because it is found in practically everybody descended from Kos, the ancestor about 25 generations before the Battle of Dysart OD, not only of the ODs, but of the O'Briens and various other County Clare surnames. Um, so if you have FGC5660, then is a subset of L226. Everybody who has the FGC5660 mutation also has the L226 mutation. Some people have L226, but don't have FGC5660. So I'll show you examples of the tree later on. And of course, 
It's not only the surname, or it's not only the DNA that mutates, the spelling of the surname mutates as well. So most of you started off as Oja when everyone spoke Irish a thousand years ago. And in Ireland, most of you are ODs, and most of you overseas are O'Days. And the pronunciation mutates as well as the spelling. We laugh here in Ireland when people come home from America and can't even pronounce their own surnames. They call themselves Mahoney and Costello instead of Mahoney and Costello. But it could well be that they took the correct pronunciation overseas with them, and we've changed our pronunciation here at home subsequently. So I'm going to say a little bit about the pros and cons of public DNA comparison, uh, because it's something that comes up in the media from time to time. Do you want to make your DNA public? Of course you do, because you want to help us to put together the family history. But there are some people who think that they can use their DNA to advance their family history, but can keep everything else about themselves private, hide their surname, hide their family tree, and some have benefit from sending their DNA off to be analyzed. That's a little bit ironic because these are the very people who are trying to preserve their own anonymity, anonymity and destroy the anonymity of their brick wall ancestors that they're trying to learn more about. So just as you will curse your ancestors for not leaving more clues behind to help you in your genealogy, your descendants in perpetuity will curse you for not leaving behind information about yourself and that includes leaving them your DNA. Uh, especially your autosomal DNA, because you pass on only half of your autosomal DNA to your children. You pass on your whole white chromosome to your sons. So that's not too bad if you don't leave that behind. But we'd still like you to submit it to the project. Um, another story that's been in the news recently, you might have heard about it. If there was a mass murderer in your extended family, maybe a third or a fourth cousin, would you like your DNA to be used to take him off the streets? Yes? Some people have concerns about that. That happened in California in the last few weeks, where uh, you might have heard of the case, the man was dubbed the Golden State Killer. He was thought to be a mass murderer. He, his last crime was in the 1980s. Uh, they sort of suspected maybe he was involved in law enforcement and knew that he was going to get caught if he did something again. But they had his DNA on file and they submitted it to the online autosomal DNA databases, and they found some of his distant cousins, and they traced the family tree based on the distant cousins, and they looked for anyone on that family tree who might have been in the place where the crimes were committed at the time they were committed, and eventually they narrowed in on one individual who matched the relationship to the people in the DNA databases and was living in the right place at the right time, so they mounted a surveillance operation and they found a discarded paper cup or something that he had used, and they got a DNA sample from that, and it was a perfect match to the DNA sample from the crime scene. So the man has now been arrested, and has to explain why his DNA was found at a crime scene 30 years ago. But innocent of the proven guilty. But that's just another example of how DNA has let the genie out of the bottle as regards family secrets of all sorts. If there's an adoption or a secret birth, or fostering or something like that, it will be revealed by DNA. And if you know of such a secret in your family and you want to keep it a secret, well, don't put your DNA in any public DNA database and make sure that nobody in your extended family puts their DNA in the public DNA database because it's not just your DNA, you share half of your DNA with your siblings and your parents. Um, so somebody will let the, the cat out of the bag eventually. So back to submitting DNA samples for the Y DNA analysis for the Y chromosome that comes down with the surname. Uh, we now recommend that everybody start by ordering at least a 37 marker STR based test, Y DNA 37, from Family Tree DNA. And here's our results page just to show you what you get back. Um, these numbers over here are the numbers of repeats for each of the STR markers that are looked at. These are the labels used to identify the STR markers. I have divided people up into groups. I'm not currently logged into the website. You can set your privacy so that you can only be seen by other members of the project or only by project administrators. So there's somebody here in the top group um, 
who doesn't want to be seen by anybody outside the project. The next group, there's one person happy to be seen, one person happy to be seen, and there's another group where we can't see until we log into the project. So marker one, almost everyone has a value of 13. Marker two, some people have a 24, then we have 22s and 23s. And eventually when we get down to some of these groups where we've six or seven quite close, it will highlight in different colors the markers that are different. So these are part of the Dalcassian DNA group. They have the same values for the first three. There's one outlier who has a 12 instead of an 11 on the fourth marker. He also has a 12 instead of an 11 on that marker. He has a 16 instead of a 17 on that marker. This first guy up here has a 24 instead of a 25, a 29 instead of a 28. And some of these mutant markers mutate more frequently than others. Uh, so especially these multi-part ones, you see a lot of color there because they mutate every three or four generations maybe. So that's roughly what you get back, or what the project gets back initially from your Y37 test. I'll show you what you see yourself in a moment. You'll also get lots of emails. Um, I might have to log in now to show you this page. I do, so I'm going to log in as James for the moment because we want to show you some OD examples rather than some uh, Waldron examples. And there's an email notification preference page. Somebody said to me yesterday, Bill, there, that he gets loads and loads of emails and they don't make any sense. That's because when this all started about 20 years ago, all they could find were 12 markers, and they were selling these 12 marker tests, and they're still sending you out notifications unless you turn it off if you match people on the first 12 markers. And if the person, if you've both bought 37 markers, and you don't match on all 37, you're not interested in the fact that you just match on the first 12, and you can turn off the 25, and if you bought 111, you can turn off all the lower ones if you want. So that's why you might be getting masses of emails that don't seem to make any sense to you. Um, but what you get back in return for your sample is also a match list. So these are James's top few matches. Um, you get a genetic distance. Again, people often misunderstand the genetic distance. These are 37 marker matches. You see it says 37 there. Um, it says 37 on that drop-down menu. You can change that and look at the 25 marker or 12 marker matches if you want. So that means out of the 37 markers, there are no differences. The genetic distance two means two out of 37 differences. So don't call it a genetic distance of zero, call it a zero out of 37 or a two out of 37 or a three out of 37 genetic distance because you will eventually, hopefully, be persuaded to upgrade to 67 or 111 markers, and 3 out of 37 is a long way away. 3 out of 111 is a very close match. So we were puzzled when this Thomas O'D came in first as a perfect match to James, and James went off and investigated. The reason we were puzzled is that the earliest known ancestor column was blank. Please fill in your earliest known ancestor. I'll show you where to do that in a moment. And eventually James started asking questions and discovered his own nephew had heard him over Thanksgiving in Boston or something talking about the DNA project. And he squandered his money basically by signing up because obviously he was going to be a perfect match to James. We would much rather him have given the money to the project or to James to get more advanced analysis done on James's DNA, which was already in there. It also predicts a haplogroup, um, the most recent mutation that it can confidently predict for you. What us as project administrators have to do is predict more recent mutations and it tells you the date of the match. And thankfully all these people have filled in their most distant known ancestor. Uh, most of them are ODs or O'Days, but there's a Howard in there and there's a Phillips, but the Phillips says that his ancestor changed his surname from O'Day to Phillips, so that explains the connection. Not sure about the Howard, but Especially in these Dalcassian groups, you will get quite close 37 marker matches to people with other Dalcassian surnames. And only one of these top matches has bought any more advanced product, and there's probably not a whole lot more advanced because it still only says he's definitely M269, not just predicted, it's confirmed because they've actually looked at that mutation. So that's what the match list looks like. That RM269 prediction, sometimes they call it the haplogroup, sometimes they call it the terminal SNP. They're both kind of misnomers. 
terminal SNP means the most recent confirmed SNP, but there are probably a lot more recent mutations that have not been looked for yet, and the terminal SNP can change as you do more advanced analysis. A haplogroup is a word that has been used for a long time to just describe a group of people with similar genes, uh, similar Y chromosome, at least in this case. It originally meant people just with a similar pattern of those STR repeat numbers, but now it means people with the same SNP mutation. These SNP mutations have only been found in the last five to 10 years. The STRs have been analyzed for about 20 years now. Um, so we can build a Y-DNA haplogroup tree. There's an International Society of Genetic Genealogists, which um, puts together the research that is done in genetic genealogy around the world. It has a wiki, and in the wiki you have these long lists of mutations and how they're related to each other. So we don't really want to go through that version. We look at some simpler versions. Here's the simplified tree of the Y chromosome haplogroups. We're all descended from what they call the Y Adam. It's a bit like what we read in the Bible. We're all descended from Adam, who God created on the first day, but it's not quite the same thing. The Y Adam is the only man who was alive at his time who has male line descendants still alive today. There were many men alive when Y Adam lived, but the surnames of the others, if they used surnames, would all have been what we say is daughtered out. Maybe they didn't marry, maybe they married and had no children, maybe they married and had no sons and only daughters, maybe they married and all their sons went into the church and were celibate, but one way or another, many men eventually leave no male line descendants behind. And I forget how many tens or hundreds of thousands of years ago this why Adam is estimated to have lived but he's the only man of his time who has male line descendants alive today. And then they found different mutations and they're able to divide up his descendants into branches. And when they started this 20 years ago, they didn't even need all the letters of the alphabet to describe all the haplogroups that they had found at the time. Now there are tens of thousands of haplogroups and you have these FGC2660 labels to identify them. But these top level haplogroups are basically at a continental level with origins about 20,000 years ago. So if you're from a different top level haplogroup from somebody else, if you're an E and somebody else is an OR, your most recent common male ancestor lived maybe 20,000 years ago, long before anyone was using surnames, probably long before humans even settled in Ireland. Um, so just to show how this has advanced, here's a branch of the original haplogroup OR, which is the haplogroup to which most people living in Ireland belong. And about five years ago, this is just one subset of it, coming down from the P312 mutation through L21. Again, most Irish people come from these branches, and we come down eventually to M222. You might have heard that described as the Nile of the Nine Hostages mutation. It was found to be very common in the northwest of Ireland. So the geneticists and the historians got together and said, can we figure out um, why everybody in the northwest of Ireland has such similar Y chromosomes? There must have been some very powerful man who had a lot of sons, who had a lot of sons, and has left his imprint on the Y DNA. And they, the most powerful man in that part of Ireland at the time in history when it was estimated he lived was Nile of the Nine Hostages. So, M222 is the technical name, Nile of the Nine Hostages is probably easier to remember. That's the Northwest Ireland DNA. C4466, that's actually an abbreviation for CTS4466, that's common in Munster. And down here we have Z253, and the Dalcassians come off that one. So five years later, or four years later, what did this look like? These top level mutations are about 4,000 years old. So again, long before a surname and it's got a lot more complicated in four years because a lot more of these mutations have been discovered. So we can see um, Irish type three, that's our Dalcassian type that we expect the ODs to belong to down here. Um, the main is there, the Kellys, that's the Northwest Irish, the M222, and more of these are Cahans or Keens, Carols, Scots, Welsh, 
the different branches have been identified with different broad family groupings and different areas in Ireland and Britain mostly. So that growth has been called a SNP tsunami. Um, there were about 800 of these SNPs known in 2012, that's only six years ago, that's only a year before I first got involved in genetic genealogy. By 2015, that had grown to 35,000. I haven't found a more recent number, but it's grown rapidly again in the last three years. But there are 59 million letters on the Y chromosome, so it's not surprising that there might be maybe about 100,000 out of 59 million, which vary from one man to the next. So there is eventually an upper bound on the number of SNPs we're going to discover. And what has been found is that men with the same SNP mutation have similar STR mutations. And um, that's why the haplogroup and the terminal SNP term have become interchangeable on those two pages that we looked at already. And as I said, you get M269 if you're Irish, probably as your predicted haplogroup when you order the basic 37 marker test when you order the more advanced SNP tests, you get a more recent predicted mutation, and we'll see those for the ODs later on. So when you get your preliminary results back, you have a choice of what to order next. For $39, you can order a test of a single SNP mutation, if it looks likely from your matches um, that that's what you have. You can order a pack of maybe 100 SNPs for about 100 $20, I think, or you can order what they're now calling Big Y 500, which looks at all the possible SNPs on the Y chromosome. We have a discount of that. It's almost $600 still, even with the discount today. And we would love it if everybody could afford to do that, would do that. But again, I won't say everybody, one person from each confirmed family group. There's no point in two brothers or a father and a son or an uncle and a nephew or two second cousins paying big money for advanced analysis of their Y-DNA when you can work out for the $59 autosomal test, yes, they're definitely brothers or they're definitely father and son and there wasn't any hanky-panky going on. So pull your funds and get the more advanced test for one member of the family. And we also have a donation page. Um, you can click that link and you can say you want to donate to the OD, OD, OD project and fill in your PayPal or credit card details. And if you're a female with no OD white chromosome and you want to invest in this, you might like to help us out. And that money can only be spent in ordering tests from Family Tree DNA. It can't be spent on anything else. It's not going into our pockets. It's going back into analysis of OD DNA. So eventually we want to overlay these genetic mutations with the surnames. These mutations go back 4,000, 5,000, 20,000 years ago, long before surnames. So we would like to know which surnames are most closely related to each other. And we have the tradition in the Clare medieval history and the genealogies and the oral tradition that surnames like O'Dee, O'Brien, O'Quinn, McNamara are all Dalcassian surnames. We all descend from Cos, who lived um, maybe three or 400 AD. And so we have his Y chromosome with some subsequent mutations. So we should all have similar Y chromosomes and come up as at least distant matches to each other, even though our surnames no longer match. Um, I did hear James or somebody yesterday talking about our great ancestor, Connor. But Connor lived 12 generations after the original D or Ja, from whom the surname is derived. So in theory, you might only be 12 cousins 23 times removed to Connor. He might not be your direct ancestor, even if you're an OD. And as I said a few times, originally um, people noticed that those with Dalcassian surnames had similar patterns of the counts of the STR mutations. And that was called the Irish type 3 DNA because it was the third Irish DNA that had been found after Nyla the Nine Hostages and one of the others. And there's even an Irish type 3 website. And I think the website is run by Dennis Wright, whose name is down at the bottom but lots of details accumulated over the last 12 years. And he runs a project at Family Tree DNA for all those from the L226 surnames with Dennis O'Brien and Robert Casey. And they've all been very helpful to us in interpreting the OD DNA, especially in the last day or two. So I'd like to say a big thank you to them. Uh, and the Family Tree DNA project 
if James and I or somebody else tells you you're almost certainly genetically from the Dalcassian YDNA dynasty, you should join this L226 project. If you're not logged in, there'll be a, not a member, there'll be a join button there. James is already a member, so there's no join button to click. And then the two Dennis's and Robert, whose names and email addresses you have down here at the bottom left, will advise you on what to do next to find out exactly where you fit into the Dalcassian family tree. And the other thing, if you go for the big Y test, you have to copy your results to the big tree. The website is ytree.net. You can see it there in the address bar. So here's an example of a branch of the big tree uh, with lots of O'Briens on it. And down here we have one O'Day. Not quite confirmed yet, it's still in a different colour to say we're working on these results. Uh, there's a Morrissey there, there's a Dunn there, there's a Bryant, which is clearly a spelling variant of Brian. There's an O'Brien with a Y. Over here there's a Keys and a Winnet. So maybe that side of it isn't pure O'Brien, but it looks like one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine O'Briens out of eleven. So it's pretty clear that these mutations up here are specific to the O'Brien surname. So the surnames were adopted about a thousand years ago. Those mutations are less than a thousand years old. And I'll come back to that later as well. So, ROD project. If you have any OD ancestry, we want not only your DNA, we want your genealogy as well, because DNA is only being used to help us to build a family tree. And the family trees have been used to help us to build the genetic tree as well. Um, at the workshop this afternoon, I'll have the kids with me. If you haven't signed up and you want to sign up, uh, there's only one warning. We want a clean DNA sample, so the rule is no eating, drinking, smoking, chewing gum, or washing your teeth for an hour before you take the DNA swab. It's done with a little cotton cheek swab. You swab each cheek for 60 seconds. So if you want to do it after lunch, have an early lunch and have clean DNA when you come to me. There are thousands of surname projects hosted by Family Tree DNA. I'm not watching the clock now, James will tell me when to, sh when to shut up. Um, because usually I can go on all day if I'm let, and then the first speaker dropped out, and I didn't have to worry about tiring myself today. So you can see surnames beginning with P, there's 374 projects, surnames beginning with O, there's 353 projects, and so on. And there's two wonderful ladies in Family Tree DNA, Janine Cloud and Heather Kynes, who help us to manage all these projects and deal with thousands of administrators around the world and are extremely efficient, so I'd like to give them a shout out as well. There are also geographic projects. The first project I administered was the Clare Roots project for anybody with ancestry from County Clare. If you have ancestry from County Clare, you're welcome to join that. Again, just follow the link and there'll be a join button there if you're not already a member. And I have learned a lot of what I know about YDNA from trying to group all the different Clare surnames into those which are genetically similar in that project. Um, you know who the administrators are, and there's the link to the OD project page that we saw earlier. We saw it with the join button at the beginning. Now I'm logged into James's kit, so I've already joined. I don't need to join it again. Um, as I said at the beginning, if you've sent your DNA to one of the other companies, you can download a raw data file and upload it to Family Tree DNA using this autosomal transfer page. Again, sorry, you can't use the autosomal transfer page because James has already sent his in. So if we sign out of James's kit at this stage and close that, then you can see what the transfer page looks like. It asks you to sign up, just wants your name, your email address, your gender, and um, then it'll ask you to upload the file that you've downloaded from Ancestry or MyHeritage or 23andMe, if you did 23andMe some time ago, the current version of 23andMe is not compatible with Family Tree DNA because they're looking more at the markers which are informative about health, not the markers that are informative for genealogy purposes. So there's not enough overlap to import the current 23andMe data into Family Tree DNA. Our emphasis is on the white chromosome, so we want OD males to order at least Y37. If you're not an OD male but have 
a brother or a cousin or an uncle or a nephew who's an OD male, persuade him to sign up. Um, then on the chart that I showed you, we want to see where your OD ancestors lived and when they lived. So now I'm going to, sorry, I should have stayed in as James, but log back in as James so that you can see this. I'll log in eventually to my project administrator account, which would be different. So I had to fix this for James last night because he had a male, most distant female ancestor filled in. Uh, what I want here is the man from whom your Y chromosome comes or would come if you were male and it gives you 50 characters, 50 letters or numbers. So we try to squeeze in as much information as we can. His name was Michael O'Dea. We know he was born in 1816. He was from Agonolo. That's in County Clare, but there isn't room to put that in. And he died in 1882 in Kill And that's exactly 50 characters. I can't put anything else in there. And the other one is, who would your mitochondrial DNA have come from? Your mother's 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 mother, as far back as you can trace it. So there we usually have to put in two surnames. James's comes from Mary McHugh, formerly Butler of Solahead Bay, Tipperary, Ireland. And again, I have no space to fill in anything else there, but if James has a date, we can take out some of the place information and put in a date. And those will appear on the um, DNA results page, which we'll come back to in a minute. Um, if you have your family tree in a genealogy program on your computer, like Ancestral Quest, which I use, it should have a facility to export it. And you can even choose who you want to export. So if I go back to myself, all you really, really need to put up on the DNA website are the ancestors from whom your DNA might have come. You don't need to put up your siblings and your cousins who might be worried about their privacy being invaded by appearing in your public family tree. There's nothing wrong with pulling up information about your dead ancestors. Um, so if I want to create a file with just my direct ancestors, I can say I don't want full information on the living. I can even say I don't want names of the living. And then I can say I want to do a partial export and I want to select um, myself and all my ancestors for 999 generations and I don't want any of their descendants. Okay, and I have 292 known ancestors documented. They're the only ones you need to put on the family tree on the DNA websites. And, sorry, that shouldn't come back up. Then you can go to the family tree page. So this would be James's family tree, I guess. And we've already done this for James. And it's slow which is another reason why I recommend that you include as few people as possible, because I have 128,000 people in my database. If I uploaded all that, it would probably crash the whole family tree website forever. <laughs> Not a very helpful family tree. All you see is James and his parents. So you click the pedigree view button. <laughs> and then you get the pedigree. And again, not very helpful because it doesn't adjust to the screen size. And even when it does adjust to the screen size, the names are a bit small to read. But there you see James's pedigree charts with his parents, grandparents, great grandparents, great great grandparents. And then if you want to go further back, you click this little arrow there. But if you've already done your family tree on one of the other websites or on your own desktop program, you can save it in GetCom format and you click the upload GetCom button there and it uploads it for you. I do not recommend that you enter your information directly on the Family Tree DNA website because it doesn't have the facility to export it as a GetCom file for you to use anywhere else. So install something like Ancestral Quest, Roots, Magic, Family Tree Maker, enter the data in that and upload the GetCom file. We can talk about that in the workshop later on if you want. It's not really part of the, the ODY DNA project. The other thing you want to look at are your privacy settings. You saw a lot of empty groups when we looked at the results page at the beginning. That's because these people have not adjusted their settings to let other people see their results. If you come down along here on um, project sharing, allow my group administrators to publish my pseudonymized DNA results and ancestor information. You have to opt in 
to sharing, so make sure you tick that box, otherwise people won't see you on the results page. Um, and what else do you need to do on the privacy page? Can I say something else you need to do on the privacy page? Yes, if you want your family tree to be seen, um, you just make the family tree public there. Um, unfortunately, uh, the algorithm for deciding who's living is not very good. If you don't fill in a date of death for your great, 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 great grandmother, it assumes that your great, 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 great grandmother is still alive and calls her private, which is not very helpful. So please make sure that you only upload the deceased ancestors and that you make them public, rather than uploading all the living people and privatizing everyone you don't know the date of death for, which doesn't help anyone. And then we have an activity feed where you can fire questions I can't keep up with email, so I don't put my email address on this, but every few days I at least have a look at the activity feed and try and answer the questions that James can do likewise. So it's a bit like a Facebook page. If you use Facebook, uh, you can put in a query there. There's some pinned posts at the top advising people on what they really need to do. And then there's a general discussion. Grant Day has come up with a query here, and then other people can comment on his query. Um, so down here you see a discussion where we come, just like the principle of Facebook or any of these other social networking sites. And that's part of the OD project, and the only people who can see that discussion are the members of the project. So it's private within the OD project. So the results. Uh, as I said, there are various different independent genetic origins of the OD surname. Some of them in the Dalcashen L226 Irish type 3 branch that I've been talking about, some outside. We have 52 members with results visible to the other project members, uh, to the administrators. 27 of those out of the 52 is all you can see if you're not logged into the project because they haven't fixed their privacy settings. So make sure you're logged in when you're looking at this and make sure your privacy settings allow other people to see you. So what surnames do we have? We have 13 ODAYs. We have 14 O apostrophe DEAs. I think I included James in that, even though he refuses to use the apostrophe. Uh, we have 10 DAYs without the O. We have a DEA. We have a DEE. We have an O small DEY, with no apostrophe and no space. We have a Godwin, which is a surname. Oh, the original word for God in Ireland is Dia, so Dia or Dia, the original man from whom the OD surname derived, ended up being anglicized sometimes as God rather than as OD, and then as Godwin or Goodwin. So it's suspected that there might be a genetic connection between some Godwin or Goodwin families and OD families, so we let them in. Uh, there are two other surnames where there's been a confirmed surname DNA switch, and they know of an identified OD male line ancestor, even though these people don't currently use the OD surname. So a surname can change by adoption, can change, somebody might be inheriting an, o, an OD farm and not have OD Y DNA, but have an OD mother and adopt the OD surname, or the reverse. Um, there can be infidelity. Lots of reasons why surnames, from time to time, don't follow the male line. There are two others in there who haven't identified their OD ancestor, but have reason to suspect an OD ancestor. One had an ancestor a brick wall ancestor who arrived somewhere in the US on an orphan train, not knowing his birth parents' details. And the other was wondering whether the OD neighbor might have been the father of an ancestor <laughs> rather than the, the official husband. Um, these things will come out of the wash. I said the genie is out of the bottle. There's no more such thing as family secrets anymore. Uh, then we have two other people who are in there because they have the same SNP mutations as ODs. So it looks like they're closely related to ODs. We're not sure was the common ancestor before or after the adoption of the OD surname or the other surname. So it might not be a surname DNA switch. It might be a pre-surname match, which is, I suppose technically it's the same thing, but from a genealogical point of view, it's a different thing. And then there's myself and four others whose OD ancestry is not on the male line. So they're just in a residual group because they're in the project to look for matches on autosomal DNA with other ODs. So I've divided them into 18 subgroups. I guess I'd better flick back and forth. I didn't put in a link here um, to the results. 
Let me first of all make sure I'm logged in as project administrator this time round. So no, I'm logged in as James, so I'm going to sign out and I'm going to sign in as administrator. So if you're the administrator account, you make up your username, so mine is P. Waldron. They, otherwise, you're just logging in with a kit number, which is a four or five or six digit number, maybe with letters in front of it. So now we're logged in and we go to DNA projects, OD project, my DNA results. So now you can see all 52 people on this page because we're logged in as an administrator. So in haplogroup group E, we have two people. I have color coded these as well. Uh, so we have two in haplogroup group E, we have two in haplogroup group I, we have two in haplogroup group J, and then the other 46 are in haplogroup group OR. So where do these haplogroups groups come from? Haplogroup group E is mostly found in Africa, is extremely rare in Britain and Ireland. So God knows how we have an OD with an E haplogroup. group. Uh, but we do, it's sitting there in the front row. Um, haplogroup group I, we think of in Ireland as being the Viking haplogroup. group. So you see it's largely concentrated in Scandinavia. The darker the color is where it's most common. Although there's a bit down here around the Balkans or somewhere where it's even more than 50%, but it's 25 to 50% of Scandinavia, Iceland, and about 10 to 25% of Britain and Ireland. Uh, the two men in Hapka Group J, where did they come from? That's concentrated in the Middle East. This time last year, up the road in the Temple Gate, I talked to the Curtin clan gathering. And Curtin is a very common Irish surname, and most Irish Curtins are from Hapka Group J. Uh, so it does occur sometimes, but less than 2% of the Irish population, but not unprecedented. And Hapka Group OR, that's the one which is really hot in Britain and Ireland, but there's also bits across Canada. Um, but the OR is subdivided into OR1 and OR2, and OR1 into OR1A and OR1B. So the OR1B is really concentrated in Western Europe, and especially Ireland and Britain. And the further west you go in Ireland, I think, the more concentrated it is. So most of us, 46 out of 52, are happy group ORs. And then we have a few outliers who we have to try and explain. Within haplogroup group OR, the Godwin has said 16270 is a terminal mutation. The Clancy is the, the man whose ancestor came on the orphan train is a DF98. The Croak is a man we let in because he has a match on a, SNP, a recent SNP mutation to the ODs. And these last five are all Dalcassians. So just to scroll through again, the top two in green are the haplogroup E's, the Africans. The next two in white or beige are the Vikings. Uh, the next two, and they have the same common ancestor, are the Welsh days. Any of those here today? Right here. Okie doke. So I think if you can trace your ancestor back to Wales in the 1300s, it was probably already pretty clear you had a different genetic origin to the County Clare ODs, and the DNA just proves that. And then the rest are the haplogroup group or as different subgroups. The yellows are the L21s. The purples are CTS4466, which is one of the three Irish groups. And the, this color is called coral. That's the one I put all the Dalcassians in. So the vast majority are Dalcassians. Um, the red haplogroups groups are the predicted ones for people who just bought the STR packet, the Y37 or Y67 or Y111. The greens are people who have confirmed their SNP mutation by buying a single SNP test or a SNP pack. Um, James is down here, confirmed DC135. So I have put his nephew with him. There's no point in the nephew who matches him perfectly in the 37 markers, wasting more money and confirming that he matches James on the other markers. He's definitely James's nephew. And there's a Fitzgerald in there who has the same DC135 mutation. Might be before surnames, might be after surnames, but he's definitely closely related. Um, the Croke DC134 is a subset of DC135. So these people are not positive for DC134. So maybe an OD became a Croke or a Croke became an OD, we're not sure. And then the exciting ones, the first big Y results 
for a member of uh, the Dalcassian branch of the ODs. John B is here somewhere, is he? I met him last night for the, the first time and he said I was at liberty to talk about his results. And they were a real mystery to me because he squandered, I won't say squandered, invested wisely um, in the big Y test. And the results came back about a month ago, and they said his terminal SNP was L226. And I said, that just doesn't make sense, because most of these L226 people who do big Ys find several more recent mutations. And he already knew he was L226, because five years ago he bought the single SNP test for L226. So I looked yesterday at the other website, which he kindly copied his results to the big tree, he wasn't an L226, he was a BY5212. So there was a glitch somewhere in the system and they never updated the haplogroup or the terminal SNP when John's results came through. So I asked my friends in the L226 project, the two Dennis's in Australia and Robert in the southern USA, what the hell is going on here? And they quickly spotted what was going on, that there was just some little glitch in uploading the results. Um, and they come in on the 13th of April, stayed L226, but he has all these other mutations. FGC5660, ZL7669, ZZ311, FGC5628, FGC5659. Just shrink the font size so that you can see them all. Um, just shrink it again so that we can see them all. There's a long list of them anyway. Uh, are they gone? And they even run off the side of the page. But the exciting thing, or the surprising thing, is who does he match? Um, the terminal SNP is 5212, YFS231286, though he has in common none other than Connor Miles John O'Brien, the 18th Baron in Chiquin, 32nd in descent from Brian Beru. Uh, so it looks like John's branch of the ODs are really a branch of the O'Briens. Uh, and that all the fostering back and forth between the O'Briens and the ODs that we heard about last night resulted in a surname DNA switch at some point, probably many hundreds of years ago. So this is what Dennis and Robert from the L226 project had to say. Uh, Dennis wanted to know where is this member come from? He was so surprised to see it. He should certainly be in the O'Brien surname project. So John, you should sign up to the O'Brien surname project. Uh, the SNP that he shares with Lord Inchiquin is certainly a Thoman SNP. It has been dated to around 1300 AD, so long after the O'Brien surname was adopted by the children and grandchildren and great-grandchildren of Brian Beru, who died in 1014 at the Battle of Clontarf. Um, so somewhere in the last thousand years, there's been an NPE, an adoption, or a political surname change. Um, it's not surprising that it's between O'D and O'Brien because the two families were so closely allied right through history in Clare. And we have only one other person in that confirmed Brian Beru dynasty who doesn't have the O'Brien surname, he's a Morrissey. And Robert Casey said, this definitely puts you as a descendant of King Brian Beru. We highly recommend getting the other STR markers tested. But Robert then looked at the other people in the project and says, actually, we have five different branches, both confirmed and predicted, all within the broad Dalcassian group of DNA signatures and Dalcassian group of surnames, but whose common ancestor would not have had the OD surname, would have lived too far back to have had a surname. Uh, so we're going to hear from Ed later on about the Kiltili group. They are negative for Z17669, which is one of the high-level uh, mutations under L226. So they have a fairly distant common ancestor with the other four groups. The second one I can't find him, I think he's not even in my OD project, but he's in the L226. I don't know if kit 517547 is here. Uh, John B is the BY5212, and James is DC135. So even though you're all down passions, your common ancestor probably wasn't an OD and probably lived before the OD surname, but you're certainly Clare people and you're very welcome here in Clare. Um, so we can look back then at the big tree that we looked at earlier, now that we know a little bit more about what's going on. And, uh, oh no, this is the branch where James would be if he had done a big Y test. There's DC135, which is James's most recent SNP mutation. 
and the surnames he matches are Martin, Croke, Crow, and then a little further back at Farrell. So again, they're not um, O'Brien specific mutations like the ones that we looked at earlier, like the one that Lord Inchy Quinn has that can be dated to no further back than the 1300s and definitely more recent than O'Brien. So our long term objective is to find SNP mutations that are specific to ODs, just like the O'Briens have done with that 14th century SNP mutation. Oops. <laughs> um, so we have seven people in the project so far who've done big Y. I put group e, e over here in the front row, who uh, doesn't match anyone else. Um, L226, I didn't change that this morning. See, I've done this yesterday morning when I didn't know anything about the 5212s, but that's, that's John B. Um, and a few others um, were not, not Dalcassians. And then we have the Proke man, who's a Dalcassian, he's not an OD, but he seems to be closely related. And then we have a McGrill of Ray, who's OD ancestry as a female side. So the more people who do Big Y 500, the better. I, sometimes I call it Big Y. It's only recently had its name changed to Big Y 500. It used to include only SNPs. It now includes additional STR mutations, bringing the total number up to 500. Unfortunately, if you bought 37, um, you get 426 additional SDRs and you still have to pay with the 38 up to 111 that you haven't bought. Have we time to go through the autosomal DNA story? How, how did I find out that I was an OD um, descendant? I did Family Finder with Family Tree DNA back in November 2013. I had this wonderful story of uh, an abandoned baby who was one of my closest matches. Uh, she's now an 80-year-old great-grandmother. She had no idea who her parents were. In the last few months, there was a lot of publicity because they thought they'd married her father down to one of two brothers who had left no other children. And the only way they could figure out was uh, which brother was her father was to see that they find some DNA that he left behind. He's long dead, obviously, his daughter is 80. So somebody had letters that he had written, and they said, oh, he probably linked the stamp on that letter. So they sent off the stamp to one of the advanced DNA labs, which managed to extract DNA from the back of the stamp, and it proved that her father was the man who linked the stamp. So she's pretty sure he's the man who wrote the letter, just as long as he didn't give the letter to his brother to put the stamp on. <laughs> And I'm not sure of the dates now. Maybe, I, I think that they, they, I haven't seen the dates, but they probably know that the other brother was dead when the stamp was linked. So that would rule him out as a candidate to be her father. But anyway, I didn't know whether she was on my father's side or my mother's side, so I went to one of my first cousins on each side and said, Can I have your DNA? And when my first cousin on my father's side, when his results came back, his top match was somebody who wasn't my match at all because autosomal DNA breaks down randomly and you can have distant cousins, or two brothers, one will match the distant cousin and the other won't. Close relatives will always match when you go out beyond third cousins. There's about a 10% chance of not matching between two third cousins. There's about a 50% chance of not matching between fourth cousins. There's only about a 10% chance of matching between fifth cousins. So this guy was a distant match. and I recognized his name. And I said, I wonder, is that the man I know with that name? And I looked at his email address, and I looked at the website, and I said, oh, he looks like a lawyer in Texas to me. He doesn't look like the man I know from West Limerick. So I did nothing about it. But I was on a committee with this man um, in September. I said, do you have a namesake in Texas by any chance? And he called for a minute, and he said, um, well, there was a man over from Texas collecting DNA from all the local historians in West Limerick, and I spat for him for 23andMe, or maybe he's bought for Family Tree DNA as well. Um, so I said, uh, are you all your ancestors from Limerick? And he said, yes. And I said, well, my only Limerick ancestors are from around Clarina and Patrick's Well and Valley Brown. And he said, well, my only ancestors from around there are the ODs. Yeah. <laughs> and I said, oh, that's interesting. And he said, um, I said, mine were Parkers and Keys. And he said, well, there was a story. The ODs were Catholic, and there were three sisters, and they married three Protestants. One was Parker, one was Smith, and one was Frost. 
And I said, well, my Parker's intermarried with the Smiths as well. And one word borrowed another, as we say. And um, I was still a little bit baffled, but he said that his ancestor had gone to work in Smith's shop in Adair, and when he was leaving after a year or two, the proprietor said to him, why oh, didn't you tell me you were related to me? And I knew the Smiths were related to me, so I said, we're onto something here. So I went back through the records that I had compiled uh, from the parish registers over the years. I knew that my ancestors lived in Ballybelogue, townland, and had come there in about 1819 from the next parish, a mile up the road across the parish boundary in Conagar townland. And um, there are no surviving parish records for Mungret Parish, where they originally lived, but there are surviving records for Patrick's Well Parish, where they moved to. And I have the details of the deeds there, um, 1819. So I didn't know whether the children had been born before or after they moved in 1819. The oldest son was left with the original farm and the parents and the younger children moved to the new farm. I went back to the parish registers. I said, let's look again for children of John Keyes baptized in Patrick's Well Parish. And I found a William Keyes, son of John Keyes and Maria O'Dee. And that had meant nothing to me as a single child. But the deed was a lease for lives where the lease would run until the three names were all dead, and the three names were the three sons of the tenant, John Jr., Edward, and his sixth son, William O.D. And by the first, second, and sixth, there was a second, third, and sixth sons, we eventually found the will of one of the sons saying that he wanted his three deaf and dumb brothers to be looked after out of the proceeds of his estate. So that's why three of the older brothers, maybe they had German measles or something and lost their hearing, or maybe it was genetic, I haven't found the gene for it yet. So that's why the sixth son got named in the lease. I have no idea what became of him, but he was born after they moved into the parish where we still have records, and his mother was Maria O'Dee. And my friend Sean is descended from Bridget O'Dee, and eventually we worked out they're almost certainly two sisters. And uh, here's the Dennis Ryan who worked for the Smiths, and I got that off a passport photograph, but I got better. Uh, I went down to the graveyard in Kilkeedy, and I found the grave of Edward O'D. Uh, died in 1840 or something, I think. So that's my great, 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 great grandfather O'D.'s tombstone in Kilkeedy outside Florina, County Limerick. And I would never have worked that out without the autosomal DNA comparison with a man who I knew, who was trying to hide by using another man's email address in Texas. And we never suspected we were related, even though we met him several times. So unfortunately, the ODs of Newtown have been daughtered out, or priested out, or whatever. There were priests, there were men who didn't marry, there were men who only had daughters. I haven't been able to find a male OD cousin to get a Y-DNA sample from yet. Uh, maybe I will someday, without my doubts. So what's the future for the project? We want to recruit more members. Hopefully after lunch, we'll sign up a few of you. I have 29 kids here, so don't know come running. Uh, but you want to be sure to get one of the first 29 be first in after lunch. Uh, we want to upgrade more members to the big Y500, and eventually we will find SNP mutations that are specific to the OD surname. Uh, we want to confirm the terminal SNPs, the people in the results page, that only have red terminal SNPs, we'd like to turn them green, find a more recent one. And um, there's a new facility available now called SAP, which will build a mutation history tree. I haven't had time to try and do that yet. Robert Casey from the L226 project is building other systems for predicting the SNP mutations from the STR mutations, which are going to be very helpful. And if you want to read more on my DNA, I have lots more on my website. And there's a link to a chapter on interpreting Y-DNA results, which goes through what I talked about today in a little bit more detail. So I think that's all I have to say. I hope I've bored it all out. I hope I haven't shocked or disappointed anyone, and I'm happy to take any questions. I think everybody should stand up and give Paddy a standing ovation for that. Thank you.
we can sit down now, but um, Paddy, I found that fascinating. Um, you know Paddy is, a, by profession, a statistician, but it's pretty obvious that he likes the, uh, you know, studying DNA, but as I said at the outset, I think Paddy always makes sense of it all for us, and I think um, every time I talk to him, I come away with some snippet uh, of information where I learn more, but I hope you this morning will have learned an awful lot about the DNA and the DNA project. There's more to come this afternoon, but Paddy, wonderful, wonderful, wonderful. It really was. And, um, Thank you. Uh, so well done. Um, you have a lot to think about, you have an awful lot to take in. The wonderful thing about Paddy, when he ever gets, gives up and gets up and gives a speech, he has it all on YouTube, all online. And he's a wonderful man. If you have a question, he'll always answer you back. Not quite there and then, but most, most likely within a day or two. So now you can put the face to the man on the emails. And uh, if anybody wants to pay for my uh, 500, uh, I'd, be, I'd be delighted to meet you. <laughs> Meanwhile, I'm saving up. But um, I hope everybody has a better grasp of that. I have a cousin, James E, down here. He had his um, uh, Y37 done recently, and he said to me just now, he said, how come it's not showing up? Well, we're going to start that out after lunch at the workshop. Okay, cousin? Hi. Uh, I was wondering, well, I'm guessing that, so a woman cannot trace all the way back to a cum. Is that, that is correct? That's only through the, the male chromosome. The yes, chromosome. only a man has a Y chromosome. Yeah. But if you have a brother or an nephew or an uncle who's an OD, you can sign him up. Right, and now, in no way has, like, is it passed from father to daughter and then to her son? Because not the white chromosome. No. Not the white okay. chromosome. Okay. What in general can a woman hope for if she submits her DNA? You have autosomal DNA, you have mitochondrial DNA, you have X DNA. The autosomal DNA will find anyone in the database who is your third cousin or closer. Uh, about half of your fourth cousins, about 10% of your fifth cousins, a small number of your very many sixth, seventh, and eighth cousins. And the mitochondrial DNA will find people who come from the same female line as you. The problem with that is it does not mutate as frequently as the Y chromosome, so you might have a perfect mitochondrial DNA match where the common ancestor is several hundred years back. And the other problem is the surname changes in every generation, so it's harder to figure out the genealogy to go with the DNA match on the mitochondrial line. But certainly do the autosomal DNA. Ancestry DNA has the biggest database. It's gone over 10 million people now. It has the worst website. So if you want to send your DNA to Ancestry, you download the results file and you upload it to the other websites, which give you better research tools. And do you, do you agree uh, so if I were to submit my DNA and it came back, you were 60% of Irish heritage and whatever, of other one. Do, do you believe that that is true? I've never seen a definition of how they work out the 60%. A percentage is a numerator divided by a denominator. I've never seen the numerators and the denominators. Okay. And they ask the people who submit the DNA to self-identify as Irish or whatever. I think it is based on their customers who say, my grandparents were Irish. So there's a debate about what Celtic is. I suppose there's less debate about what Irish is. So I'm skeptical of those numbers. And there's a huge margin of error. So they give you 2% Ashkenazi Jewish or something, but the margin of error might be plus or minus 4% around the 2%. So don't pay any attention to the small bits. They usually get the big bits reasonably correct. But you, I've even heard of people sending in two samples and getting slightly different results because there's some random element to how they actually do the calculations. And different companies have different reference populations. The reference populations are really tiny compared to the 10 million people in the database. I have a cousin that's the VDEA, Phil Day, that's on there. And I was wondering, is it worth it to have my grandson do it? Because I have all daughters. I only have a grandson. And, and that's amazing. <coughs> but your grandson then won't, won't, have, it, won't have the ODY chromosome. He won't. No. Okay. Not if you're, 
Yeah. Ancestor is the OD. If his father is... His father is not. It's not an OD. He has his father's white chromosome. Okay. All right. That's Absolutely right. no point yeah. in okay. him joining the OD Y DNA That's project. He's welcome to join the OD project because he has autosomal DNA from you and from your OD ancestors. But he doesn't have the OD Y chromosome. Okay. He has his father's white chromosome. All right. Thank you. Anybody else? Okay. This lady over here. Hi, I recently joined the L226 project on behalf of my nephew. And so I've been in contact with Dennis Wright. And I asked him, how reliable is the genealogy from Cass to Brian Boru? And how reliable from Brian Boru to the present discount or whatever that guy is? And he thought the genealogy from Cass to Brian Boru was sort of questionable. And I just wondered what your opinion was on that. Oh, I would agree that anything that's passed down by oral tradition can get changed. And even if it's a written DNA, if there's a 2% chance of an NPE in each generation, when you've gone through 40 or 50 generations, probably more likely than not that there's been an NPE somewhere along the line. But, um, we do find that the Y-DNA signatures of the families that the annals tells us were related tend to match up more often than not. So there's some grain of truth to those ancient genealogies, but there's no contemporaneous written record of them that were written down many hundreds of years later usually. And they can trace back to mythological figures, which we can say with near certainty didn't really exist. So somewhere along the line, the further back you go in time, the more blurred the distinction becomes between history and mythology. And families did try and create uh, royal descents for themselves at later stages as well. So there's a grain of truth in there, but just, it's, just, not the, it's not the Bible. Just, just one thing on that, you know, the two snakes? Yeah. Well, the only one to prove they went back to the time of Moses. And you know Moses in the desert? Yeah. That's where that comes from. Next. <laughs> Anybody else? Just over here, Janet. Land of Marcus. Holy Moses. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, uh, well, my grandfather, was Michael O'Day, but he came from Mayo, the town of Mayo, T Mayo Abbey, they call it that. But he always signed his name, Michael O'Day, and, and um, I wanted to know, but I sent something to South Mayo when when I first came. It was the second time I was here for the, uh, you know, back in the 19, 1990 was, I think, the first war. I was after one of those. And the fellow that did the genealogy, I mean, he was, his father was a Rod Richard Godwin. Okay. Mary and Mary Fitzpatrick, and they were all from that same area in Mayo. <coughs> and then someone in uh, from Massachusetts told me their family was from the heat. They were old days. But uh, I was talking to Ed O'Day, and he said, and he was, and um, we're still trying to find out this Godwin thing. And from what I understand, it was changed from the, um, in Mayo, there was a family named Dean, or they, Dean. Well, as I, as I said earlier, the Irish word for God is Dia. So when the Irish yeah. surnames yeah. were being anglicized in some places, OJ would have been turned into Godwin. Maybe if there were Godwins with a different genetic origin already living in the area. Well, uh, and sometimes it was turned into OD or OD. Okay, I had my, my DNA done, <coughs> excuse me. Ancestry.com. And um, well, I came up with, I don't know, 42% of the rest of Scandinavia, mm -hmm. you know. But, but you need to find a male Godwin or a male. You're an OD or a Godwin? Uh, well, You're the OD. I guess, no, I'm a Vanderbarter. <laughs> Vanderbarter. Well, you, need, you need to find a male with the surname to submit yeah. the Y DNA. And I don't know. Don't know anything. 
so I can't curse them. <laughs> yeah. But you might you might find in your ancestry DNA matches you might find a male who's related to you through a common OD ancestor. If he has the surname, he has the white chromosome to go with it. Call him and sign him up. With family tree DNA for the Y-DNA 37 at least to start with.